The new season is a new occasion for interesting meetings, incredible discoveries, and curious stories. My name is Konstantin Koksin. I'm an ethnographer, Turkologist, traveler, full member of the Russian Geographical Society, director of the Museum of Nomadic Culture in Moscow. My name is Tinkai Kritova. I live in Kazakhstan. I study the history and culture of the Great Steppe. The culture of nomads of the Great Steppe is my favorite topic, which I have been researching for many years, and I have something to tell about it. I think that we will hear many new and unexpected facts from you. Welcome to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. The role of the woman in any traditional society is difficult to assess. She is a caring wife and mother and the mistress of the house who is in charge of everything. Now imagine the same thing, but in a constant motion, not only for modern citizens, but for the residents of a traditional Russian village too. The life of a nomadic woman would seem a hell. What position did women occupy in the nomadic society? How is a woman's life actually organized during a nomadic journey? Imagine that you are focused to move in a new apartment every two weeks. Just imagine you have a good fantasy and describe your life. I think that first of all, I would have to get rid of everything unnecessary. Right. Believe me, you would soon have two cases left, like did the wives of the Red Commanders in the 30s. As soon as an order was issued, they picked the cases up and left. Only the most necessary things. For a Russian woman, moving is worse than a fire, as they say. But for a nomad, this is normal. It is happiness to live in motion, to constantly move. How do women cope with the role of a housewife when things are kept all the time either in chests or in carts or in a sleigh, when you have to cook on an open fire and, frankly, there are no facilities? In the Kazakh tradition, girls from childhood get used to work and until some age they learn along with boys to sit in the saddle, behave at ease, shoot arrows. But later, the girl becomes a woman, and she realizes that she must become a good mother, a good housewife, which is the main mission of the woman. Everything else, the emancipation, that a woman should work, it all came from the West. In fact, it's normal that the woman is the mother and the mistress of the house. And it is good that traditions are better preserved in Kazakhstan than, for example, in Russia. But in Russia, it is preserved better than in Europe. Let's look at examples. Look at the life of women in a nomad camp using the example of different nations. Let's agree. You will talk about Kazakh women, and I, for example, about the Mongol women and the residents of the north, with whom I've wandered a lot and saw all this with my own eyes. It is generally accepted that a girl, well, is not a desired child, because she will grow up and leave the family. But the boy, on the contrary, will grow up and bring a woman and offspring to his family. But as far as I know, the girls of Kazakh society even could sit in a place of honor next to their father. That is, they were greatly respected. 
We cannot compare the position of a Muslim woman in a settled society and in a nomadic one. The situation of nomadic women used to be higher than that of other women because she cannot be locked anywhere, sit at home, do not go out. How? If the house belongs to her and she assembles and resembles it. Of course, Kazakh women, Kyrgyz women and Mongolians were much freer, more open than their settled neighbors. This is normal. Islam is the first world religion to speak of women's rights. Islam is the first world religion to speak of women's rights. It is important to know about it, because now everyone represents Islam like Sharia. Put on a burqa, put on scarves, you must. The Prophet Muhammad, the guardian of Allah, salutes and says this. If Allah wanted to humiliate a woman, he would have created her from the foot of a man. If he wanted to raise her up, he would have created her from his head. He created her from the rib so that a woman was always with a man, always at hand, under the protection of the man, and from the rib which is close to the heart so that a woman would always be loved. Not a single prophet did say such a thing about women. They, you know, the prophet had only daughters. Boys, if born, died in infancy. He said that if a father stroked his son's head and said a good word, he did a good deed. If he stroked his daughter's head and said a good word to her, he did an act pleasing to Allah. This is Islam. This is classical Islam. This is a great attitude. But later distortions accumulated, and as a result, this clean, beautiful attitude towards a woman turned into a nightmare when women were not allowed into mosque. They were told to pray separately when they put on horsehair cocoons on women. This is extreme, but the nomadic women were lucky. They were always free. When a Kazakh girl reaches the age when she can already get married, Boyzhetkin, this is 16 to 17 years old. According to traditions, she wears a full set of jewelry. And by the age of 17, she would already be in full jewelry ammunition, a ready-made bride-to-be. Jewelry is not only a symbol of female beauty, a thing that emphasizes female beauty. This is still wealth. And the main thing, this is amulets. Metal protects from evil spirits. Talking about traditional jewelry, especially wedding decorations, it is important to remember this. How are they created? What ornament they have? What are they made of? Of course, this is a language and this is amulets. And later, they became jewelry. Ziyad Satinbek, who is a jeweler, antique dealer, will tell us about traditional Kazakh jewelry. Uh, here, we have a headdress. It is called ukilyu takia. These are feathers of an eagle owl. It's like an amulet. The eagle owl is a sacred bird that does not sleep. It always protects. It's all made of silver. There are also stones. Carnelian stone is a sacred pure stone. It is used in different jewelry for hair and improves posture. Does it weigh a lot? May I hold it? Yes, you can. It is so light, very convenient. Is it worn only by unmarried girls? Yes, only unmarried girls. How else can we understand that the girl is Boizhetkin, on marriageable age, not yet married? You can usually figure this out with a ring. This ring is called the bird's beak. This means that she is still like a bird. She is not married yet. She is still flying. Seeing this ring, you can make a proposal. Moon-shaped earrings? Yes. I often see them worn by adult women, never by girls. Why? They are more serious, and girls often have stones, a lot of them. They are brighter. And this is serious, solid decoration of an adult lady. This is the bride's headdress, Saukile. It comes from the word Saukilu. If translated, it means arriving without incident. When a girl is going to get married, her father specifically makes such a headdress for her. 
and this is reflected from afar in the sun. The tradition of Suyun Shi, a little kid runs around our yard. Suyun Shi, Suyun Shi. It means good news. Kilin is coming to us. I will be pleased to walk around here and watch more. Thank you for telling me all this. Thank you. Women have always been tradition keepers. Therefore, let's say a mother sings a lullaby in her native language. For example, if I marry, say, a Mongolian woman, she will sing Mongolian songs to my child. I'll marry an Argentinian, she will sing Argentinian songs. Therefore, it was always very important where the wife came from. It was checked. Women keep traditions, transfer these traditions. The mother read fairy tales to me, probably to you too. I grew up on my mother's tales. And finally, a woman gives birth to children. It is her main purpose. There are many traditions of how they look at girls and adult women determine how she will give birth. This is especially evident with the peoples of the north in Chukotka, where there is no restriction in this regard. And women's dances, girls' dances, are so erotic that you can't look at them calmly. It is probably the time to move to the place where a woman spends most of her time. To the hearth? Why do the Kazakhs make the hearth triangular? It seems to me that this is related to the symbol of the mother goddess, Umai, a triangle. It is curious that I have seen such hearts among shamans in the far north and Central Asia. Before starting the ceremony, the shaman always puts three stones. The shamans explain it in different ways, that these are three worlds, middle, upper, and lower, that these are three times, past, present, and future. Here I recall the banner of Timur, Tamirlan. As they told me in Kyrgyzstan, because the Kyrgyz people also have a triangular hearth, these are three generations who sit at the fire, us, elder people, and our children. This is an ancient symbol. Only subsequently, it was replaced by a circle, the endless circle of life, the rotation of the sun, the rotation of time, the wheel of time that rolls and does not spare anybody. What do you think, Tinkai? What art or craft is most valued in the far north? I think in the far north, first of all, men have to do even more difficult work than in our area, and women probably assemble homes. Assembling homes is generally the norm for nomadic women. Almost all nomads assemble homes. Maybe they make some kind of warm clothes and shoes. Until now, in the north, warm clothes are sewn from small skins with reindeer veins. And imagine, my wife sewed a fur jacket for me. There is a frost of 40 below zero. I threw a lasso 20 meters from the house, and my sleeve came off. And who is she after that? A widow, because I won't get home alive. When boys and girls meet on holidays, on the day of the reindeer herder, on the crown's day, the guys do not look at the figure of the girl, because under the fur coat it is not visible. But he does not even look at her face, he looks at how her fur coat is sewn. What a seam is like, has she been lazy? Because a good wife and a good sewer are synonyms. To become a bride, a girl must sew five fur coats for herself, and casual one without ornaments, a rough, work one that is used to poke in the ashes, a festive one which will weigh 12 kilograms and will be all decorated with beads, and two more for the husband and for the guest. And when the guest arrives, she will carefully cover him with the fur coat. Most importantly, when a girl by the age of 16 has sewn five fur coats, she already sews without looking at it. First, the ranger veins are taken, the threads are made with the teeth, and the seam is such that it does not pass water. Fantastic! Even little girls do it. There lived a 90 years old lady in our tomb. She was blind, but she sewed by touch better than her granddaughters. Here is the main thing for girls in the far north and in the Kazakh culture, what was the most important in girls? 
Вот главное искусство для девушек на Крайнем Севере. А в казахской культуре что ценилось в девчонках? В казахском традиционном обществе... In the Kazakh traditional society, too, from an early age, they learned to sew. They learned to sew dolls from reeds, from chia, and wrap them with ribbons, cords, and sew dresses for these dolls. They were led by a grandmother who showed them how to sew, how to apply ornaments, so our girls learned to sew. The same thing with the nenets and the hanti. Dolls are made from the leftover cloth used by mother and grandmother, as well as from deer skin. They play with them, and then they make a handbag for needlework. And then they begin to sew shoes, hats, fur coats, and they sew constantly. The fact is that the ranger wool sheds heavily. The clothes wear out quickly. In fact, every year you need to sew new clothes for the whole family. It is very important that in all traditional societies, a woman sews for a family, and as you correctly said, to assemble homes is a woman's work. The Mongolian yurt is traditionally assembled by women. They themselves load it on a cart, on a camel, and assemble it themselves. The Mongolian woman decides herself where to put the yurt. The great Genghis Khan, who conquered the fifth part of the land of the planet Earth, used to say, I am my wife's guest in the yurt. In one hour, two Mongolian girls assemble a yurt. When I first assembled the yurt in Moscow in my museum, I was busy for two days. And on the second day, I had to call a crane, because I had no idea how to fix this heavy shanirak on the top. Then I saw two girls lift it and turn it upside down. Now my employees easily assemble the yurt within an hour. The Turkic, Kazakh and Kyrgyz yurts are more complicated and elegant. It takes one and a half, sometimes two hours. In fact, I was told that in the Kazakh family, the female family members assembles a yurt in an hour. Well, another question, is it a large or small yurt? A huge 7-meter yurt cannot be assembled in an hour. Carpets, tikhemets, this is what lies on the floor, hangs on the walls with ornaments. A woman makes it all. By the way, today Kazakh women are often engaged in this craft. They roll felt, embroider patterns. Their carpets are even sent far abroad, because they are in demand. Yes, and here under our feet there is alakiz, which is made of colored wool. It is a very interesting technique. There are such stitch korpiche. This is completely modern thing. And this suggests that the tradition is alive. They are still doing it now. Even if they use sewing machines, do not do all with their hands. But what amazes me in the art of Kazakh craftswomen is the tukskiz that hang over the beds in a yurt. There is such a delicate ornament, a true virtuoso, embroidered it. I have in my museum a large collection of kuiz brought from Mongolia, China, to where the Kazakhs wandered in the 53s, 48s, and the name of the craftswoman, the year, and some kind of distortion of an absolutely perfect symmetrical ornament are shown there. When I asked elder women why this curve had been made, they answered, not to anger Allah. This is how the Russians say, humility is a foundation of virtue. No, I could have made an absolutely perfect carpet, but I'm making a mistake. That is, they value their art, and I don't even know which is more difficult. This embroidery on deerskin or kuiz of Kazakhs, curls of Kyrgyz people, virtuoso work. Moreover, there are not only objects of art, this is a whole story. I myself saw in Kyrgyzstan, when the whole big family sits down in the evening, neighbors are invited, the old woman tells a story, and together they sew, first for one family, then for another. And little girls help bring the scraps and soak up the story that the old women tell. This is how knowledge is transmitted. I suggest to you going to the Otraun Museum of History and Local Lore. There is an exposition that is directly related to our topic. We will be accompanied by a wonderful guide, Nursiyid Amzia. For some nations, weaving is a purely male occupation. But as far as I know, in Kazakh culture, women weave. What types of weaving are presented here? Here you can see how the lasso was made. Here are special skimmers. They use these. That is, skimmers that women use in cooking. They are tossed. Yes. Well, wool was prepared here. It was specially cleaned, divided. Was it divided with sticks? 
внезапно существует кисьпелаша, урмелаша и так далее. Вот. Это yes, with a stick. There are kispia alasha, ormiak alasha, and so on. This is a carpet loom. We have done such a model, but it is more complicated compared to the ormiak alasha. Natural coloring, chemicals were not taken at all. We had special trainings on natural coloring, how to color, where to take natural colorants. Different types of plants were taken, nuts, onions as well. Nursiet, you call it a model, but this is not a model. This is quite a real loom. That is, you can sit down and continue. Mostly, our girls did this. In summer, when they were on vacation, five girls wove about 22 days. This carpet, four by six. Say, the excavations in Paracas, the desert in South America, which has a perfect dry climate. It has not rained there for centuries. And everything in the burial chambers was preserved at a depth. Hundreds of shades, 190 shades of color, are known there. Moreover, the density of the fabric is up to 200 threads per square centimeter. How this was done is still unknown. Well, this was done for decades. Boil the wool in the dye itself. Boil the thread another time. Someone fix the materials against the sun, against the light. This was known to different peoples on all continents. I think that the same thing was done here. The old carpets that we've seen in the yurt and in various museums show that the shades are rich and beautiful, with a deep color. And the fact that over the centuries it has not lost its brightness says a lot. The steppe woman was always militant. I know many stories of how Kazakh women wrapped a towel around their breasts during the war with the Jungars, put on armor, pretended to be young men, and galloped on the enemy. When a war reaches such a bitterness as the war of the Kazakhs and the Jungars, both women and children fight. I think this is not an isolated case. Every nation knows the name of a female warrior. But that did not necessarily happen during the war. I know that in Kazakh villages, a woman could protect her village from robbery by grabbing a stick, bakan, from a yurt and simply driving enemies away. By the way, I know that in the Kazakh traditional society, a woman played national games, horse racing, even after marriage and after she had children. Moreover, a hundred years ago, there were women, kokparshi, in our steppes. How did husbands let them participate in such competitions? I think there was a tradition of letting women do this. This also confirms what we are talking about, that a nomadic woman, a step woman, was always freer than her sedentary neighbor. And nowadays, a Kazakh woman is capable of many things. Our women ride horses, shoot from bows, do crazy tricks. And they are not adult athletes, but young girls who are 16 to 18 years old. Great. And returning to the fact that nomadic woman was always independent, sometimes it went to extremes. You might have heard about the women's unions of the Turks. Just out of the corner of my ear. Then I'll tell you in detail. Turkic Kaganat, eternal country. Firstly, the laws of the eternal country implied the death penalty for rape. Find more examples in ancient society so that a woman is not perceived as a thing, as an economic object, as working hands. The death penalty, like for a murderer, tells us historians about the highest position of women in Turkic society. Well, as far for women's unions, young girls aged between 13 and 14, gathered in groups of 10 to 15 girls each, took men's names, wore men's clothes, and were engaged in martial arts. Ходили в мужских одеждах, занимались воинскими искусствами. Надо сказать, что it's worth saying that the nomadic world can be proud of great women. Can you name the great women of the Turkic world? In history, there are many examples of truly militant women who are imprinted in the memory of, probably, the whole continent. For example, Tamiris.
You know, I have an ambiguous attitude towards her because she killed Cyrus the Great. When I worked in Iran, I visited the grave of Cyrus. He was not accidentally nicknamed the Great. Yes, he conquered vast territories, but even the enemies treated him with respect. Tamiris was the queen of the Massagets. Cyrus the Great, although he was warned not to cross the Rex, this is Amudarya. He invaded the area of the Massagets. And what did he do? He left on the advice of Croesus a small army of weak, sick people and set the tables where there were all kinds of dishes and wines. Of course, the Massagets attacked quickly, killed the disabled and began to feast, noting such an easy victory. Then a real Persian army attacked them. Many Massagets were killed, many were captured. The commander Sparkabis, the son of Tamiris, was captured too. She sent ambassadors to Cyrus the Great. And the ambassador said, give me my son and leave our land, otherwise I will give you blood to drink, even though you are Cyrus insatiable. Cyrus did not heed the warning and went on. They say that there was a battle on the shores of the Sirdarya, where Tamiris, having gathered a huge army of Massagets, defeated the Persian army. Где Тамирис, собрав огромное войско массагетов, наголову разбила персидскую армию. Почти все персы полегли, и сам Кир Великий погиб в бою. Она велела найти его тело, отрезать голову. Almost all the Persians died, and Cyrus the Great himself died. She ordered to find his body, cut off his head, filled the wine bottle with human blood, threw Cyrus head there and said, I give you blood as promised. How did Spargapis die? Sparkabis himself said, let me go, Cyrus. Not wanting to continue the war, Cyrus ordered to unleash the Massagets. Barely freed Sparkabis like a real nomad, for whom captivity was worse than death. It was a shame, drew his sword from the guard and rushed at him. I don't know what the Massagets used to say, but the Kazakhs used to say that freedom was more precious to man than gold. And the great founder of the Persian state died somewhere here, in the steppes of Kazakhstan. Tomiris did the right thing as a mother. She defended her native land, but I sincerely feel sorry for Cyrus. Tamiris is very popular with us. Many girls are named after her, Tomiris. But I have one more favorite period in history. This is the period of the Turkic Kaganets. There was one extraordinary woman there, Po Beg or Po Fu. An amazing fate, Po Beg is her Turkic name, and Po Fu is a Chinese transcription. An ambiguous figure, she reminds me of Zarina of the Saks, who, firstly, was the queen of the whole city, the wife of the military leader, with a cool name, Murmur. A squad of beautiful girls went hunting and meet, of course, the Persians. Zarina was in front, she was wounded with an arrow, and the Persian warrior reached her to kill. The helmet fell from Zarina, golden hair was scattered on the shoulders, and he saw that it was a girl. A noble Persian, he was a prince, could not raise his hand against a woman. Moreover, they liked each other and decided to date secretly. She went hunting, and he said, guys, I'm going hunting. But Zarina had a condition. She was tired of the war, and she said, no warriors, we will just date and love each other. A beautiful romantic story. But as you know, the husband noticed that she went hunting too often. He found out that she was dating the enemy, brought a squad with him, and the prince of Persia was captured. She asked her husband to unleash him. After all, he had come without warriors. He kept his promise. She said that the Saks did not need war. But the husband did not relent and wanted to continue the war. Then the beautiful Zarina killed her husband, and the prince, of course, proposed to her. But Zarina said, I love you, but as soon as I become your wife, my people will lose their freedom. Let's wait, meet in a year and discuss everything. They met a year later, and she said the same, I love you very much, but I will not become your wife. And they broke up. It's a beautiful story about a girl who, choosing between love and duty, chooses duty. Zarina refuses love for the sake of her people, acted like a real queen. We can be proud of her, really.
ради своего народа. Поступил как настоящая царица. Ей можно гордиться, действительно можно. Послушай, а что же объединяет все Listen, what in the end unite all of nomadic, Turkic, Mongolian heroic women? То, что объединяет вообще... What unites the nomads in general is freedom, love for freedom, independence, and a fantastic skill, yes, fantastic, to create coziness and comfort in extreme environmental conditions.